Good morning, everyone. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go through representing stresses at a point. We already did that before at the first couple lectures. But today, if, for example, if you are given like a 2D problem like this, or you have a 2D shape like this, you probably know that this represents a beam. I just, even though I drew it in 3D, but if I draw it like this in 2D, this is a beam. And for any point in the beam, we can find the forces by drawing the internal forces diagrams. For example, axial force diagram, shear force diagram, bending moment diagram, okay? But now it's different. So now I'm, I'm not asking you what is the forces at A, now I'm asking you what is the stresses at A? What is the state of, state of stress at A? Or I will tell you draw a stress element at A. So we already did that before which is at point A, what I basically want to find, I want to find what point A feels. And it's a point, but I exaggerate this point by drawing it in a stress element. And this square is a dimensionless, it's like very small. And I want to know what is the shear stress at A, for example. What is the stress in X at A? And what is stress, stress in Y at A? So at the beginning of the semester, I used to give you this stress element. So what I'm going to do now, or what we are going to do today, we are going to establish it. We are going to derive it. And at this point, I think we already went through how, what, is, what is, for example, the tau, which is the shear stress, and we derived its equation, and we understood its meaning, and we actually built an intuition for the shear. Same as stresses, which is uh, the normal stresses. So I'm now confident that from now on, everything's going to be quickly. So there will be no more der derivation. It's just application for all these stresses. So what does that mean? Which is asking you, what is the stresses at point A? or draw the stress element for point A, or what is the state of stress at point A. So when I draw you point A in 2D, that means point A lies in a cross section that is here. And I basically want you to find the forces that is applied to that cross section, which is this one. I just took it out here. And here is point A. Okay, so find the forces that is applied for that cross section, whichever you have, whether it's moment, whether it's shear, it's normal, or whatever, and then draw the stresses distribution, which is the normal stress distribution, shear stress distribution, and then where point A is gonna lie, it's gonna have all the stresses due to the stress deformation or distribution. So we basically, gonna apply what we did throughout this whole semester in one of this topic's problems. So again, this is what we call stress element. It is a graphical symbol that we use to represent the state of stress at a specific point, okay? And it has no dimension, so it's literally a point. So let's start with this example. So we have this traffic light, and we are asked to calculate the stresses at point A, and draw the stress element at point A. So point A is here. And again, point A is just a point, but out of this problem, what we want to do, we want to come out with a stress element from point A. So now we are interested in this column. We are not interested in the beam. So what should we do? We should eliminate this cantilever or this beam. And we already went through this before. So if I want to find the axial force that will be applied to this column, what should we do? OK, so let's start first. OK, before anything, let's start with the axis of bending. What's our axis of bending for this, co for this column, which is, a, which is a circle? And if you're not given 
um, axes just assume yours. So I have x here and I have y here. So x and so here is x and here is y. So how is this loads going to force the column to bend about? Which axis? x. So at this point, it's easy now that you realize that it's x-axis. Because once you realize it's x-axis, so I will just delete this y. And all the moment of inertia, all this of the centroid or our, equ our equation will be based on this x-axis. So you first need to identify where is the axis of bending because everything else is going to depend on that. <coughs> Every single point that we're going to have in this problem, we spend a lecture or two in it. So this problem mostly covers everything. So if I want to find the axial force that's applied to this column, so I know that this column, if I eliminate this cantilever, I know I'll end up having a P, which is an axial load, and I will end up having a moment. And we agreed that the way that we draw the moment, you're going to draw a curve that is as if it's warping through the column from above. And then you either put me the arrow, either the left side or the right side. What do you think? That's correct. So now you identify the direction of the axial force and the moment. So now we need to find their value. So to find the value that, or the axial force that this column going to support, what should we do? We should basically sum all this axial, all this forces in y direction, or like in z direction. If this is z direction, right? Because that's what the column is gonna support. So what I'm going to do now, so for point P, or sorry, the axial force P, it is 35, which is the distributed load of this beam. So this beam has a weight, and this weight is distributed over its length. And then I do have two point loads, which comes from the the traffic signal. OK, so it's 20 pounds each. So I do have 35 times 24. I'm converting this distributed load to a point load. And then I do have plus 2 times 20. And that's all the axial forces that the column going to support. I'm going to get 880 pounds. So I want to put the 880 pounds. Although you can't see it here, but the 880 pounds should be applied at the centroid. Okay? Same as when we want to find this bending moment. We already agreed on that. I don't want any of you to get the bending moment at the surface. No, the bending moment is calculated at the centroid of the column. So if I want to find that bending moment, I will say this point load, which is 35 times 24 times half of the distance. So if the whole distance is 24, Half of it is 12. In addition to that point load times that distance, I do have 20 times 24 plus 20 times 12. Do you all see it? Any questions? So if I want to write the moment down, I will have 35 times 24 times distance of 12 times 20 times 24 plus 20 times 12. And I'm going to end up with a bending moment equal to 10,800 pound foot. So I'm going to put here, M here is 10,800 pound foot. So which, 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 which element we are studying? We are studying that column, right? Column, yeah. So we want to find at the center of that column. Yeah. Okay. OK, so now we found this. In addition to this load, I want to add another load, which is a torsion to that column. It is in that direction. And I'm going to say dm around z, assuming that the vertical the axis here is z, I'm going to say 3,000 pound foot. And this torsion actually is due to wind. So if I do have a wind, so if the wind is coming that way, for example, if the wind is coming that way from the back of the, of the light, it's going to cause the light to want to bend that way. Do you all see it? The reason why I only put the moment, I should have put a shear also. Because the, the, bending, so the wind will come in a distributed load, right? And when I want to 
It's not vertical. I'm just doing it in 3D. The wind is coming that way. Okay? I should have added here a shear force also in that direction, but it will make this problem complicated. That's why I just like eliminated it and I will just add the M torsion. That's why I didn't add the distributed load in that direction there. Okay? As if I'm just adding this M torsion here. Tell me. It is just I it's just yeah just I, I I just make it up so let's say I just make it up so you're not confused okay don't worry but yeah you're right you're right where it come from it should I should I should have given you a distributed load in that direction but the reason why again I'm not giving you a distributed load because I don't want you to put a shear force here in addition to that M torsion it will be very complicated and you will have a diagrams not only in one direction, you will have a diagrams in other direction. And I don't want to make it complicated, but you are right. Okay? So now just to keep the diagram in one direction, one direction means I want to, I have a moment in MX, so I want to draw only the moment in the MX direction. If I added a shear, then I'll have a moment in the other direction. So you will have a, a biaxial bending. And we discussed that before. In this class, I'm not interested in biaxial because biaxial you're going to take it in advanced classes, so there is no need to make it complicated. I would just like want to focus on uniaxial bending, which is only due to one bending moment, okay? So due to these loads, I have an axial force of 880. So now, I think you guys are an expert now, which if I want to draw the AFD, I'll just make a constant line here, minus 880 pounds. The bending moment... I want to, I have only a bending moment that way, and I don't have a shear force. Shear force is zero. So if you follow this process of putting the arrow that's warping through the beam and putting the arrow that way, the arrow tells you where to draw the bending moment. So I'm drawing that way because the arrow tells me draw it to the left. And at this point, you know why it's constant, because there is no shear force that will decrease it or increase it, and also there is no shear force diagram. I'm going to put positive, but if someone put negative, I don't mind. As long as you put the moment in the right direction, because moment indicates where the compression is. So if you draw the moment that way, whether it's positive or negative, I don't care. But if you draw it that way, that's when I know that when I divide the column into two, I know that this side is in compression, this side is in tension. You can either figure this out through the moment, or you can imagine how the column is going to bend. Finally, due to that M torsion, I want to find the free by diagram due to that MZ. MZ, I'm going to use the right hand, my thumb is pointing up, so that I'm going to have 3,000 pound foot looking up at the free by diagram. Right hand rule, make your hand follow the bending moment. The thumb is pointing up, so the double arrow is up, which means if I want to draw the internal torque diagram, it's going to be positive. So the torque, I don't care what the direction, but the torque we care about the positive or negative because positive now means it's pointing, it's, it's, it's twisting out. If it's negative, it's twisting in, okay? And we're going to need this later in the question. So now we finish the internal forces diagram, internal, yeah, internal forces diagram, bless you. Now let's focus on the stresses because again, the whole point of this question I want to find the state of stress at A. So to find the stress of st state of stress at A, we need to go o over everything. And A, if I draw the cross section for this column at the bottom here, A is here and B is here. Right? You have a question? Okay. So now let me put the, the bending moment on that cross section and since the bending moment at point A, and point A is going to be here at the bottom, so here. So point A and B is lying on that cross section, which is here, here, here. So at this point, I do have an axial force of negative 880 pounds. So I'm going to draw the centroid of this circle. So I have a solid circle with a diameter of 8 inches. And at the center here, I do have an axial compression force of 880 pounds, okay? In addition to this, I do have a bending moment, and the bending moment, the compression is that way. 
So if I want to draw it in, three, in 2D, the arrow should look to the left. So if I want to draw the arrow here, for that represents the bending moment, it's going to be <coughs> like this. And I'll say mx is equal to 10,800 pound foot. And let me draw it in a different color so that when I start put, to put the, the, the signs, it will be, cre be clear which one is which. So I will, want, I will put it in orange. So do you all see why the arrow is looking that way? And when I draw the arrow that way, that means due to the bending moment, the left side of the cross section is going to be negative, going to feel compression. The right side is going to feel tension. That's due to the bending moment. But due to the normal force, which I'm going, I'm going to draw in black now, the normal force or the axial force is negative. So that due to the axial force, all the quadrants here are going to feel negative. So now when, I'm, when I want to draw or when I want to calculate a stress at A, I know that the N over area, which is the axial force, is going to be negative because point A falls in the negative negative zone. And I will say minus M X over, or let me, M Y, M X Y I X. Okay? M X because this is the X axis, or this is, this is X axis, and also this is the bending axis. And I assume that it's X. So if this is X, this is going to be Y. Okay? This is my assumption. Anyone can can and can like assume their assumption. So mx, which is moment about x, so the moment, the moment of inertia, it should be parallel or it should be around x-axis. That's why I wrote here ix. Okay, and y here is the distance now <coughs> parallel to the moment. So the y here is not gonna be like this. Now the y is gonna be this distance, which is equal to now four. Is that clear? Before, you are used to have a circle like this and the moment looking up. That's why you used to take the my over i, and here was y. And notice that the dimension here is parallel to the moment. So if I change now the moment, now the distance from the centroid to the point where you want to calculate the stress at is going to be horizontal now, or parallel to that bending moment. So if I want to calculate a stress at a, I'm not going to plug in the number. I'm going to have it in the PDF. Um, the class note for this lecture is going to be detailed here, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to write the answer here, 2594.25 PSI. So the stress at B now, I'm going to say N over A, and now I'm going to say plus, because point B falls in the positive region for the bending moment, M, Y over I, X. And Y above was equal to 4 inches, and y below is equal to 4 inches as well. And I'm going to get 2562.42 PSI. And tell me. Can you remind again what the black negative signs are in? Yeah. So due to that this n, the axial force, or the cross section here, look in here, the cross section feels the compression, right? That's, that's what the axial force diagram tells me. So if the axial force, if the cross section feels n equal to negative 800, so anywhere in the cross section gonna feel a negative force. Tell me. So is the positive? No, no, no. From the very top to the very bottom, any cross section that I will take in here, it has the 880 pounds compression. What's that? No, point B also gonna feel compression. Because AFD, no, 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 AFD doesn't tell you where the tension of compression is. AFD tells you, okay, at this point, all the cross section feels an axial force of negative 880. What you are, I think, confusing this with is the bending moment. Bending moment tells you where the compression is. So if I have a cross section here, if I draw the bending moment to the left, that means this side is in compression, and now this side is in tension. That's the bending moment diagram. And a common mistake that although you have an n and, and moment, you will only take one term. No. If you have the moment and you have a normal, 
the normal stress equation should, should have everything because that's a general equation. If you don't have the normal force, yeah, that's when you will take only the my over i. Okay. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And it's given in the table. Okay. okay? But the thing is, in for circles, ix is equal to iy. Okay? okay? Because it's the same thing. Okay. Last thing, if I want to draw now the normal stress distribution for this beam, I do have and I'm drawing now the reference line that I'm going to draw the normal stress distribution horizontal because it's parallel to the bending moment. And since I draw the bending moment horizontal, that means the distribution, distribution of stress is horizontally distributed in the beam. So at point A, I do have a compression. And point B, I do have a tension. So I'm going to say negative, positive, and 2, 5, 9, 4. And here I do have 2562. PSI, PSI, that's normal stress distribution. <coughs> okay? And notice that the numbers here are not equal. If the numbers are not equal, that means the neutral axes are not at the center. And will that align with our understanding of the neutral axis or no? So should the neutral axis be at the center or it should be shifted? Shifted where? Yeah, left, which is, which is, no, wait, wait a minute, what is left and right? Oh, okay, it's, it's, it's flipped here. It's flipped here, okay. So you all agree it's here, right? So the neutral axis should lie in a region where you see a negative and a positive. I didn't draw it to scale, but if I would draw it to scale, I do have 2964 is larger. This one is less. That's why it's going to be here, right? And it's not a huge of a difference. 2594 from 2562, it's not, it's not a huge difference. So if you want to find where the neutral axis is, <coughs> neutral axis is going to be in a region where you are adding and subtracting the normal and, and the moment. So I'm going to take this equation again. So I'm going to take this equation. Yeah, and instead of a stress at B, I'm going to set this stress is equal to 0 because that's where the stress is equal to 0. And instead of y being 4, I'm having this y as an unknown. So now you have one equation with one unknown. And you will end up with y equal to 0 0.025 inches, which tells you that this distance is 0 0.025 inches. And it does make sense. That's why the, the numbers are not, there is no huge difference in the numbers, which tells you that the neutral axis is almost at the central. Okay, now we are done with the normal stresses. Let's go to the shear stresses. <coughs> we do have, we do have the torsion. It is counterclockwise, which it was that way, right? And point A is here, and point B is here. And from the shear stress due to torsion lecture, we know that this bending moment it is resulted of all these forces times these r. So from this understanding, now we know the direction of that shear stress that will be applied to that cross section. So if I want to find now the shear stress due to torsion at A, I'm going to say tau is equal to t. I want to say rho, or you can say radius at A <coughs> over J. And tau A is going to be same as tau B, because what's changing in this equation is only the radius, or where you want to calculate the stress at in like terms of radial distance. So for that one, let me write the numbers. You're going to have the, the torsion. It is 3,000 pound foot. I multiply by 12 to convert this foot to inch. And then the radius is 4 inch over J. And I gave you J in this question 402. But if you want to calculate it, there is a table for that. And you're going to get a shear stress is equal to 358.1 PSI, which tells you the shear stress at the end here is equal to 
3.58 PSI. I don't need to mention that this here is a stress distribution at any point within the cross section. So this stress is going to be repeated here, 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 and all the way. Okay? But there is no need to draw all of them. It's just one of them is enough. Tell me. Because what, okay, what, what point A feels? Okay, what is, the what is the normal stress distribution tells you? Tells you if I'm drawing this circle in 3D, okay? This is point A, this is point B. I'm saying that point A gonna feel compression stress until the neutral axis, and then after the neutral axis, you have a tension stress. Wait a minute. Bending moment and axial stress, they are both normal stresses. Because normal stress is the forces or the stress that as if it's going to apply tension or compression on the cross section. So if I'm applying bending moment like this, so the bending moment is basically tension to compression to one side, because that's bending, right? So if I have a bending moment here, that's bending. I'm bending it, right? I'm applying compression here, and what's happening here? I'm pulling it. So that's, that's still normal. In addition, the axial force or the normal force, I'm pushing it or pulling it. That's still the cross section feels an tensional compression. Unlike the shear stress, which is now the force gonna feel, or the cross section feels friction. It's not now tension or compression. Is that clear? Okay. Now let's move to the, po the, like, <coughs> the whole point for today. After now doing everything, let's find what is the stresses at A? We already did that, but let's represent it in the state of stress uh, form. So if I want to find what is the stresses at point A, I'm gonna, I want to find all the stresses and I wanna put it in a form of that stress element, which is a square that has no dimension, which is, it is just a point, I'm just exaggerating this by drawing it as a square, and same as D. Right? So I want to find all the stresses that applied to that point. So when you're asked to do so, you want to find, you want to cut here just at the point surface. So as if you want to cut, to cut at the point. So we are cutting at the point. And when we do so, we're going to find we are having something like this for point A and for point B. Again, it's a point, I'm just exaggerating by drawing it as a square. So, for point A, which is this square that I drew on the, on the diagram, which is here, I'm just drawing it back here, just now to put all the stresses on it. And here is the square for point B. So let's fill this diagram with the stresses common mistake that you fill it with forces, but don't fill it with forces, fill it with stresses. What I mean is, at point A, when we draw the normal stress distribution, we had the normal stresses which were something like this, right? Compression from one side, tension from one side, and the values are 2594 and 2562. So at point A, I do have an axial or normal stress in compression, and it's going to be in y direction to that element, and it's going to be 2594, and here 2594. What about B? What is B going to feel? Tension. Tension. What, 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 what value is going to be? 2562. Now, here y, 2562, and 2, 5, 6, 2. Notice that I didn't write negative or positive, but instead I represented the signs by either pushing the element or pulling the element. So what's missing here is now the shear. So if I want to draw another one, I should have done that earlier, one minute. 
Uh, it's going to take a minute. Bless you. Now the same. Now the same, the same cut, but now I want to draw the shear. But from how the M torsion, because the M torsion going to cause that shear, how it was rotating ar around the, the cross section, it was rotating that way. Let me draw it inside. Do you all see it? Right? So notice what's happening here. What's happening here is the force, the shear force, was looking that way, which is the positive direction at point A. And if I know one side, I know everything, because I need to have arrow, arrow, and tail, tail, arrow, arrow, and tail, tail. And that's a positive shear stress, because it's pointing to the top right. Tell me. OK, you know that it's the M torsion is that way, right? So when you, as if you d break up this bending moment, which is the M torsion, to couple forces that will, if you multiply these forces by a distance, you're getting that M torsion back, right? So if it's rotating that way, so and here is your element, it is rotating, so it's looking that way. Just draw it, just, draw, just take this guy and magnify it here. Yeah, right hand rule. Take this guy, because M torsion, look at my thumb, but not, not look at my thumb, look how the M torsion rotates. So the moment, when we derive that moment in the torsion lecture, we said this moment is nothing but forces times radial distance. And when we integrated everything, we came up with the MZ. You got it? OK. So if you, if you didn't see this, let me write now the number. It is 358. Let's look at that, point D. So the force also is moving that way. Which direction? So here, I have B. And here is the torsion. So here's the shear stress at one side. And again, if you know at one side, you want to equilibrium this with the other side, which means the lower side should be like this. And if it's rotating that way, you need to counter that by adding those two. And if the shear is looking to the top right, that means the positive shear. Which means also, now I can draw this. And the tau is still positive 358. Is that clear? OK, now we draw the stress element. And we will design our beam, or our column, at a location we have the maximum stresses. But the thing is that not all the cra cracks or the how the beam breaks happens in the xy direction. So what we did, we found the stresses at a point in the x and y direction. If you design on those, you're gonna, it's going to break, because the failure didn't happen in the x and y direction. The failure happened at some direction, that is the element is rotated some degree, because this is now a tension, a tension failure to some stress element that is rotated by some, this, by some angle. So now, if I rotated this to some angle, which is like this, now I know that this element is the element that caused them the failure. OK? So now, after having all this semester doing everything in stress and, and x and y, you're going to find that the beam doesn't break in x and y. It breaks in a certain angle. And this is something you need to consider. For example, this pipe, as you see, it failed at some angle. Or not failed, it, it, it cracked at some angle. And believe it or not, this, this crack in this pipe, I know this because I worked in that industry. So Shell Offshore to pay 2.2 million fine to that crack. In addition to this 2.2 million, you have 3.9 million. So a total of 6 million because you didn't consider that direction. So I, I don't think the firm will be happy with you if, if the firm had to pay 6 million because you didn't consider some stress element in some direction. OK? Any questions? So how, how should we do this? So if I do have a crack, or if I want to consider some certain angle in the beam, I need first to find the x and y, 
And then I will basically rotate this x, y with some angle that I might know previously that the beam gonna break. So I will rotate this stress element to some angle. Why, why is this happening? Why it is at certain angles the, the failure happen? Because the normal force, sorry, the sigma x and sigma y, from what, what you see here, you have sigma x and sigma y and the shear in this direction, it's safe. But when you rotate the element, you will find that the shear might be added to the axial, to the normal forces, and that's when you're gonna have a maximum stresses at certain points. I, I'm gonna show you that in a moment. But this idea of the, or the process of changing the stresses from one set of coordinates to another, that's called stress transformation. So basically, what we want to do, we want to have this stress element that has an x and y axis, we just want to rotate it to some certain angle, which is theta. Theta here is measured from the x-axis. So that's what we want to do. So before I go through how we do it, you want me to go back? No. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Based, based on the derivation that I'm going to derive now, I'm going to measure it from the x. So the equation that I'm going to derive now is going to be measured from the x. But if you want to derive your own equation, you can have your own assumption. But the assumption for this class, based on the derivation that I'm going to show you in a moment, it is like this, right? OK, before I go through the derivation, I want to just remind you of something. I think you took it in high school, that if I do have an if OK, first, the angle between the certain axes is 90 degrees. So n and t is 90 degrees. And x and y is 90 degrees, right? Which, if I said that this angle is 30, you will agree with me that this angle is 60, right? And therefore, if this angle is 60 and the whole thing is 90, so this angle is 30. Based on this, what I'm proposing here, whatever angle is here, is going to be same as here, is going to be same as here, is going to be same as here. So the angle is same as you leave one, same angle, leave one, same angle, leave one and same angle, and so on, because we're going to do this a lot. Another thing, if I do have two parallel lines, and I do have a line in between them, if I do have an angle here is equal to 80, the other angle is equal to one. 100, because this whole thing is 180. So what I'm proposing here is if this is 80, so this is going to be 80, because this is like also acute angle. And then you have 100. So from now on, if you have this angle, I'm going to always assume that you know that this is the same as that angle. OK? So this too is important in this derivation. So with this derivation that I'm going to show you now, how we rotate <coughs> a stresses to some certain angle, it is based on the assumption that the theta here is always measured from the x-axis. And in addition, the theta is positive in counterclockwise direction. OK? That is based on the assumption that I'm assuming. In addition to that assumption, I'm assuming everything that coming out from the surface is positive, OK? Which, which if anything became negative, so it's going to be negative or compression, OK? What I basically want to do, I want to rotate this element. So this element, I want to rotate it. But the thing is, I can't deal with it like this, because it's an equilibrium. In different words, if I took summation fx for this element, this sigma x is going to cancel that. If I took summation fy, this sigma y is going to cancel that, and this is going to cancel this. OK? So what should I do? Even though I know that this point, where I drew this stress element, this point, it's in equilibrium, yes, but it feels a stress of sigma x, sigma y, and it feels the shear. So what I'm going to do now is instead of treating this element as a square, 
I'm going to treat it as a triangle. What I'm doing here is I'm taking this guy. I'm going to copy. Let me erase this. I'm going to make a, a cut in this element. And I'm, I'm going to erase the other side, which, which is the side that will make everything equal to 0. Now I know that this point has a sigma x, sigma y, and has a shear of tau xy. Of course, if I add the other half, that means they will cancel each other, which makes sense because this point is in equilibrium. But what I want to do, I want to find what will happen if I rotated all these forces. If I did this here, everything going to cancel out, and I'm not going to get anything out of this. So let me say that this is the angle that I want to rotate this element about, which is what you see here. If I took this guy and I put it here, and just small rotation, that's the new stress element that I'm, I want to come. So when I cut in that face, whatever comes out of that face is going to be stress normal. And I'm, I'm writing n because that's in the n direction. And whatever going to go that way is going to be shear. And I'm going to say nt because it's, that's, it's in the face of nt. We did this before. When we had a beam, and when we cut at any point in a beam, when we cut at any point, point in a beam, we had to put a shear force V, and we had to do a bending moment, and we had to put an axial force, right? When we cut in any point in a beam. That's the same to what we did here. When we cut in an element, we know that any face in the element has a normal stress and has a shear, which makes sense when I cut in any element here. I cut in here, so I have an axial or normal stress, and I have a shear. Tell me. What's that? No. D did you see any moment here? We didn't see any moment here. There is no any moment. And instead, we have the, f the, the shear that will cause a moment if I remove those, if I remove these two. The upper and the lower will cause a moment, and that's why we put the counter shear. OK. So what I want to do now, I just said that this is the y-axis. It is here. And this is the x-axis. And from the properties, if I, if I rotated this element to that angle, that means that angle is same to that angle, which is same to that angle, same to that. And if I extended that line, it's going to be same as this. So this angle, same as to that, is same as this, same as this, same as this. OK? Which also tells you that I wanted to rotate the element from x to n. And I'm assuming the angle here is theta just to come up with an equation that is general to any angle. So if I want to rotate now this element, if I want to rotate it to any angle, this theta is going to work. Because I'm assuming the theta is some variable that I don't know. So whatever angle that I'm going to come with, it's going to always get me the normal, for normal stress to the surface that I want to rotate about. So let me put it back here. And what I basically want to do since when I cut in any angle, when I cut in any angle, so the, if, if the angle here is 10, that is something like this. If the angle is 80, I'm going to cut like this. So the area is going to change on the way how I cut. So what I want to do, I want to assume that this area is called dA. OK? So this area is called dA. And since I know this angle, so from the properties also of, of what we did, I, th I think, in high school, if I do have a line, the horizontal component to that line that is close to that theta, the area from the back surface, I'm going to call it dA cosine theta. 
and the lower one is dA sine theta. So I have this area. What I'm basically doing, I'm just having a resolution of this area over the x-axis, which is in the back now, which is going to be here. This area is dA cosine. And now the bottom area is the, this line sine theta. OK? So just, just bear with me. We're not going to do any crazy math. What we're going to do, one minute. I know that this is sigma n, but I want to now convert it to a force, because now I want to take into, into account the area. So you know that the force is equal to stress times area. So the force in that direction is going to be sigma n, the area. And the shear in that direction is nt times the area. So that's the face that we cut. But this face, since we, have, we had before stress in x that we already derived, I'm going to multiply it by dA cosine theta to come up with the force that is applied to that area. The reason why I did this, because just to make this equation general so that when I can cut in any theta, and I'm, taking, I'm accounting for any area that will come from that cut. So now if I want to fill it, so this shear in red, so xy times the area, it is going to be dA cosine theta. At the bottom, it is y, and then I do have dA sine theta. And for that shear, it is xy dA sine theta. Hello again. So I'd like to continue what I did in the lecture. So what I said that we're going to have some sort of theta here, which is this theta is the angle that where how we want to rotate this element. So this element is theta, and this theta is same to that theta. And depending on that theta, this area is going to change, which is what you see here. This dA is going to change depend on the theta. That's why we're just going to assume this area is going to be dA. The horizontal area that's down, which is underneath it, it is dA sine theta. This one is dA cosine theta. And then we said that when we cut an element, we are having, we are having stress and we have a shear. Okay? So the reason why we are dealing now with forces instead of stresses because we want to account for the dA, which is the change in the area that's going to happen here due to the change in the angle. So we are keeping it this way so that when we want now to come up with the n and tau nt, because now the, everything here is, is known, the y is known, going to be known, the tau xy is going to be known, the theta is going to be known, everything is going to be known. What is unknown now, it is the stress in n and the tau nt. And that's what we're going to have in the problem. When we solve the problem, xy, tau xy, everything is going to be given, the theta is going to be given. What's going to be unknown is the sigma n and tau nt. So that's the unknown now, and that's what we want to find now. So what I want to do, I want to take summation, all the forces, because now, now they are all forces. I want to take all the forces in the n direction and t direction to come up with the sigma n and tau nt. And how will I do that? I will just arrange this in a very nice way, which is I will take this and put it here in the n direction. I'll put this tau and put it in its t direction. Same as this sigma x dA cosine theta, I'm going to put it in x direction. I'm going to take this y, the shear, put it in y direction. Same as this stress. And finally, this shear. So now since I put everything in its, its own coordinates, either x or y or nt, what I want to do, I want to find this sigma n. And I want to find tau nt. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to 
have all the forces that is not in nt, I want all these forces to be in terms of n and t. So what I'm going to do, I know that this angle here is theta. So this theta is also here, also here, also here. So basically what I'm going to do, I'm going to take each one of, for example, this forces that is in x, that is in y and x, and I'm going to do the resolution in n and t direction. So sigma y dA sine theta times cosine theta, and that's the resolution or the component of this in the t direction. And then I will take the same thing, and I'll apply by sine theta, and now I have the component in the n direction. I will do this for this guy, for all the forces in the y and all the forces in x's. And when I do this, I will come up with this shape. So what I did basically, I did the component for all this vertical element, which is y element, and all these horizontal elements. So since I did the component, so I, I no longer need them. And what I'm going to do, and again, remember, what is unknown here is I want to find everything in terms of sigma n and tau nt. So I'm going to find summation fn equal to 0. OK, so I'm going to equal this. This guy is equal to this. And then summation forces in t equal to 0, because everything now is in forces. They are no longer stresses, because I'm applying them by the area. And this is what you see here. And I want you to notice that the dA is on all the terms. So if I divided the whole equation by dA, I'm going to cancel the dA. So all these dA's going to cancel in both equation. And, and now I'm left with only the stress equation. So I'm, I return back to the stress. And now I took in account the area and the theta and everything. And now I do have the stress equation. So what I did, I just used the trig function, the trig table, identity table, and switch all the sine square and cosine square and cosine square minus sine square with the trig table until I came up with this two equation. I want you to notice something. This equation, which is sigma n, this is the stress when we rotate the sigma x by theta. So x will go to n, so the closest, so whatever we have from x, this theta is 2n. And n is the stress that is perpendicular to the surface that is rotated. And now also t, tau nt is the shear which is going to be parallel to that direction. OK? So we have n and we have tau. But the thing is, when we find n, we have n this way and in that way. Same as tau. If we found one tau, which is this way, we found all the taus. By equilibrium, everything going to be here. But what about tau, uh, sorry, sigma t? So again, sigma t is a stress that's perpendicular to that surface. And remember, the sigma n, that is the stress when we rotate x by theta. So if I rotated x by theta, I'm getting n. If I rotated x by theta plus 90 degrees, which is here, theta plus 90 degrees, I'm getting sigma t. So sigma t, basically, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to copy this guy. And instead of n, I'm going to put t. And instead of theta, it is going to be theta, which is, I'm going to call this, for example, theta 1. This is theta 1. And theta 1 is equal to the theta that I want to rotate this element about plus 90 degrees. And this one, if theta 1 is equal theta plus 90 degrees. OK? And I want you to note something. So the theta is from x to n. And it's measured from the x-axis. And it's positive when it's counterclockwise. And it's going to be negative when it's clockwise. That's our assumption for that derivation. So let's do an example. So I have an example here, which tells us calculate the stress if you rotate this element by 58 degrees. 
So notice that sigma x is 16, sigma y is 42, everything is given. Sigma tau xy is minus 50. Rotated by 58, you basically gonna plug and chug in those three equations that we concluded. So let's start with sigma n. So sigma n gonna be equal to sigma x plus sigma y over two, which is 16 plus 42 over two, plus 16 minus 42 over two, because the equation itself has a negative here, times cosine two theta, theta is 58, plus tau xy, and tau is negative. And our assumption when we derive the equation, for here for example, everything was positive. So it's coming out that's positive, and here the shear is looking that way, which is positive. And the reason that way is positive is because, look, look in here, when I rotated this element this way, anything that's coming out of n, of course that's positive, and now anything that is like this, which is the top right of the element, that's positive. That's why this tau nt, this one, is positive. So I assumed everything in positive direction. So when I have a shear that's given in negative, like here, and instead of now tau xy, I'm gonna write minus 50 sine two theta. And theta here is equal to 58. If you did this, you're gonna find sigma n equal to minus 10.24 megapascal. Okay, now this is for n. For t, I'm gonna copy the same equation and I'm gonna, instead of n, I'm gonna write t, and instead of 58, I'm gonna say 90 plus 58. 90 plus 58, and here, 90 plus 58. And 90 plus 58, that's 148. So I'm saying here, two times 148, and here, two times 148. If we did this, we're gonna find that the stress is equal to 68.24 megapascal. Finally, the tau nt, I'm having minus, and then in the bracket 16 plus, no, 16 minus 42 over two sine two theta, and the theta is 58, okay? Plus tau xy, and tau is negative, so I have to say minus 50 cosine 258. If we did this, we're gonna find that the shear is equal to 33.6 megapascal. Last thing, I want to draw what I did. So, if I want to draw the rotated element, I will first of all take the original element, and that's the x and y, okay? And then, since I rotated this x and y by 58, Positive means counterclockwise. I'm gonna say 58, and then I'm gonna draw the new element here on that. Okay, now I know that this direction is n, and this direction is t. Let me just erase this and put the n here. Okay. In the n direction, which is now sigma n, I have negative 10.24, so minus 10.24 megapascal, and that's sigma n. And on the other side, of course, I'm gonna have negative 10.24. And in the t direction, I have positive 68.24, and here positive 68.24. Finally, the shear is positive, which means the top, they are looking at the top right, tau, 33.6 megapascal, and here is the tau. Lastly, I do have the same problem, but instead of rotating the element by 58 degrees positive, which means counterclockwise, we are rotating it by negative 30, which is now clockwise. Same thing here, but instead of sigma x gonna be positive, like what we did before, we had it negative here. So I'm basically gonna change the sign of the sigma x. And when I draw the element, instead of drawing it up, 
Now I'm going to draw it down because I'm rotating it clockwise, okay? And this is all I have for this lesson. Thank you so much.